Today's webinar is the future of online learning leadership. Hi everybody, I'm Megan Raymond. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. And we're thrilled that you're here for this conversation today. We have amazing panelists that have put a lot of thought and work into this conversation. As we go through, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box and we'll make sure to get to those. If you wanna to contribute to the conversation, please do so in chat, but do put your questions in the Q&A box because otherwise we lose track of them. Kim will share a link to the slides and you can go ahead and download that. We're recording this and we'll share a link out to the recording with you as soon as possible. If you wanna post questions or follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A. We're going to try and get to all your questions. If we can't, we'll share those with the panelists and I'll get back to you. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's moderator, a longtime friend of WCET, Dr. Luke Dodden. Luke is the Chief Online Learning Officer and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Success at the Alamo Colleges District. Welcome, Luke. Hi, Megan. It's uh, really great to be with you today and all of our uh, attendees. I'm uh, excited to have the opportunity to moderate this panel and talk about the future of online learning leadership. Um, I just uh, have a small request of the audience. And one of the things that I have to do sometimes uh, for myself is, is give myself permission to be present. And so I'd like to invite you to be fully present with us for the next 50 minutes. Uh, we, we promise we've got some good content for you. Uh, but but you're invited to do so and just be uh, fully present with us. Give yourself permission to put down the phone, turn off Teams, turn off Slack. I have all those things, right? Uh, and just, just hang out with us a, a while and enjoy the conversation and contribute to it with your questions and your comments. Um, so without further ado, I'm, I'm happy and, and proud to welcome our panelists. Uh, we've assembled a, a very diverse group of leaders uh, that are going to speak with you today, and they're going to introduce themselves to you. Uh, to you. Andrea? You're muted. I am so sorry. <laughs> Hello again. I'm Andrea Jones-Davis. I serve as the Executive Director of JSU Online at Jackson State University. I currently oversee all of the distance and online learning activities for traditional and non-traditional students, and I am honored to join this outstanding panel discussion today. And Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa. I'm the Director of Academic Innovation at the Dorrance Sife School of Public Health, Drexel University. Uh, among other things there, I work with faculty to develop online courses and programs. Um, and I built our first Master's of Public Health degree from the ground up, which launched last fall, which is very uh, appropriate timing for current events. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And Lurgia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lurgia Olivo. I'm Instructional Design Manager at FIU Online, which is Florida International University's uh, centralized distance learning unit. Uh, I oversee a team of instructional design professionals that uh, we design, we develop, and we maintain fully online and um, hybrid courses for the university. I've been with FIU for about 10 years in a leadership role since 2016, and I'm also an adjunct instructor for the Honors College and the English Language Institute. Um, I'm on the board of FLVC's ID network, and I'm also happy to say that I'm in my last semester of coursework for my doctorate um, in teaching and learning, focusing on uh, teaching ESL in the online modality. I'm also very happy to be part of the panel today. Great. It's nice to have all of you. Uh, next slide. So uh, our topic uh, is online learning leadership. And we're going to really uh, explore four domains today, uh, inclusive, entrepreneurial, uh, diverse, and hybrid work. So we had promised you global, but after we talked about it a while, we felt hybrid work was a, a more appropriate topic for the audience. And so we're going we're gonna to swap that, that out. Um, before we do that, I want to set some context um, on online learning leadership in the United States and, and how we've seen these roles grow. So I want to quickly examine with you, and, and your slide uh, may be a little 
uh, cut off there, but the growth of chief online learning officers. So I have that title, but there's a lot of people that do this work that don't have the title, right? So whatever your title is or wherever you are in the world, uh, I, and if this is the type of work you do, you're not alone. There's a lot of us doing this work. And we have our friends at Quality Matters um, and Edge Adventures to think. They studied for four years uh, and they're still studying it, uh, the changing landscape of online learning. And so uh, you'll get a link to the report after the next few slides. Uh, but this information comes from a, a report they do uh, that we affectionately refer to as CHLOE. So CHLOE 4 is the changing landscape of online education navigating the mid, uh, mainstream. And if a lot of you haven't seen this data, it's okay. Because in March 2020, we were all moving courses to remote. And so it may be time to revisit uh, that report um, so, so we're going to, again, post that, uh, post that uh, note in the chat, the link to the report if you want to read it. Next slide, please. Not only are the number of uh, the chief online learning officers growing, but the responsibilities. And one of the things I really liked about the Chloe 4 report, because I've read all of these with, with great interest, is that it's, it not only asks about responsibilities, but it asks people for their co-responsibilities. So what's in your core and what's in your co? Um, and I just will, I'm going to be quiet for a moment and just have you reflect on that. And maybe you can give us a thumbs up or a, some kind of notice in the chat that says, yeah, this looks accurate for me. Um, and because our responsibilities are very broad. And I want to applaud the researchers for uh, really learning from the past findings. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, what QM and EduVentures does is they will pre-share their results and ask people to give feedback. And you can see improvements in the questions over time. Next slide. One of the other findings of the report is that and I think we can all identify with this. Uh, I'm curious what the response would be today is that um, our, our roles, our responsibilities are growing. So whether they're in your core or whether they're in your co-responsibilities, they're growing. I mean, I, I can speak from personal experience. I've been doing the work of a chief innovation officer uh, since February, in addition to my other role. Is there a new title? No, I'm just doing that work, right? So, and I'm, I'm judging by my panelist expressions and the smiles that are like, yes, this is, we are left definitely in the more responsibility domain. So as we shift to our first topic, that's just to ground everyone and, you know, what we're talking about and why we're talking about it, right? There's so many people involved in this work. And how do we really think about the future, right? There's a lot of the present uh, to take care of, but how do we think about the future? Want to advance the slide? <laughs> Great point. Uh, that's a, a good point, uh, uh, Dr. Cummins, is the, uh, is, is the change management. We might want to advocate that they add that in the, uh, as one of the choices to respond to. So we want to focus on the future being inclusive. Um, and leaders are going to need to focus on deepening partnerships between faculty and staff and ensuring that institutions of higher ed can compete with industry in attracting top talent. Um, and everyone is interested in talent, and we certainly are, right, as teaching and learning institutions. And, and so our, our first question uh, that we're going to consider in this domain of, of inclusivity um, is, uh, Megan, do you want to, uh, there you go. So at what point do we evaluate our services to meet the needs of our students and institutional missions? So that's the that's the first question that we're going to uh, going to ponder. So our, our panelists from FIU is going to tackle that one for us. Great. Um, so I'm uh, reflecting on this question. I really do think that the most important part of uh, meeting the needs of our students is that our faculty are are happy that you know that they're well supported that they feel empowered um, to carry on the institutional mission and so it's essential for us that our units um, do intentional research in collaboration with the faculty to discover what are their hesitations about teaching online how can we improve um, their experience how can we involve them in the process as opposed to you know just implementing initiatives or setting mandates that um, really just alienate them and make them seem like faculty and make us seem you know the support 
Um, and so at the end of the day, I think um, faculty are very research driven and very research focused. Um, so we have to speak to them in their language um, in order for us to be successful. And like I said, faculty who are happy, who are supported, um, who are willing when they teach online will really provide the best learning experience for their students. Um, and as far as students themselves, I know um, FIU Online does a really good job of implementing um, the online success coaches. And these folks work uh, side by side with students to make sure that they have everything that they need um, to be successful from the moment that they come in until um, they graduate, they check in with them uh, regularly and really make sure that they have um, they have their resources. So at least at our institution, I know the success coaches are integral um, to the success of the students where otherwise they would have a very alienated um, experience, very, you know, disconnected from the university. Melissa or Andrea, any, any follow-up thoughts? You know, I'll just add that um, in JSU Online, we have a, um, like um, she mentioned, her success coaches, we have a designated academic evaluator that monitors our student and faculty engagement. So our team is there to make sure that our students and faculty are aware of all of the services that we offer. We, I feel that it's so important that institutions have a systematic um, review or evaluation of all of the available resources. So what we're doing now, we're currently implementing a self-evaluation of our student support services for our online population, you know, just to make sure that our student services are comparable to services that are offered for our on campus students. And we're using the OLC quality scorecard for online students. And also just going in looking at the quality, the student and operational outcomes, and not only student feedback, but faculty and staff feedback as well. So our goal is to make sure that we include all of our stakeholders in the evaluation process and not look at evaluations as being negative, but a, a way to give us the opportunity to see what's working and what's not. One, I know our time doesn't allow it, but we could even start to think about what we include as evaluation, right? So we're running... Yeah advertisements right now and I had a staff member spend four days responding to Facebook responses. But what's in there is a lot of evaluation of the organization and, and it's it's all over the place, right? Some's good, some's like, ooh, and some's kind of middle of the road and you have people that are appearing as peer advisors like, well, we should hire these folks. So uh, again, we don't have time today to explore that, but you know, uh, I would say keeping the student at the center and it's not enough to collect the data. We need to close the loop. Well, what do we do about it? Right. Once we know, what did we do about it? Um, so uh, we're going to progress just for time. We have a lot of content to cover to our next. Uh, our next theme is entrepreneurial. And for those of you on the call that know me well, I lean into this space. I love the entrepreneurial space of online learning leadership. Um, but leaders, if I believe in the future, and I think our panelists do too, that are going to need to continue to be entrepreneurial. And I think even more so. Um, stacking, blending, aggregating learning experiences, helping learners to own the evidence of their skills, I think is the future of our industry. Uh, and some of that future is here, right? Uh, we're seeing that, but I think even more so. So uh, with the next question that we have, um, this, I, I have to be honest with the audience, this is one we borrowed from uh, a podcast that, that we listened to, but what are the capabilities that you must develop in your team uh, to remain competitive in online learning, right? So what are those capabilities when you look across your teams um, that that you need to develop within them? Uh, and Melissa, I think you're, you're going to lead us off here. Great, thanks. Okay, so I think one of the most important um, capabilities to develop is the ability to connect with adult learners. The trends in higher education are that students are becoming increasingly non-traditional and they're demanding flexible learning environments. So when you're developing a program, you really need to think about what will set the student up for the most success. Is it a part-time program, an online program, a hybrid program? Can they stop and start? Uh, can they start in more than one term or only one time per year? And then for the faculty, um, I think a solid knowledge base of learning theory is really critical. Um, at least in my experience, when there's a marriage between content knowledge and subject, subject matter expertise, then you get a course that's really accessible to all different types of students in all different environments and levels. Um, and then that's where I also think that uh, institutions really need to invest in instructional design support. Um, faculty shouldn't necessarily have to be experts in online learning. Uh, you know, I work for a school of public health. I mean, uh, you know, these people are 
amazingly brilliant. I don't know very much, I've learned a lot, but I don't know a lot about epidemiology. I certainly did when I came here. Um, but if you marry that knowledge with an instructional designer, um, then it can be really a great uh, collaboration on a course that is giving the students the content they need, assessing them correctly, and um, also having the faculty feel really supported so they're not being thrown into this environment they don't understand. What about our other panelists? Anything to add on capabilities you're really focused on building within your, your teams that you lead? Um, I'll jump in. Um, I think one of the things that we need to do um, a little better is um, identifying the trends, um, seeing what's coming up in the future and not just like um, reacting to what we're seeing now. You know, there's a lot of changes that have um, that have started in some of the industries, for example, the banking industries and all the new regulations. Uh, this has significantly changed the way that that industry does business. So in this case, it's not about getting those people a degree a lot of them already have degrees but it's like jumping into the moment and retaining the current um, workforce and giving them the skills that they need for today that perhaps they didn't need yesterday so it could be a micro credential it could be a certificate it could be something something like that um, not necessarily student-centered not necessarily looking 100 percent always at the degrees um, but learner-centered and knowing that adult learners um, like melissa said earlier um, our, our focus is adult learners. They're always learning something new, whether it's because they have to for their job or because they want to, um, looking closely at, you know, things like competency modules and, and just increasing learners' um, knowledge base, right? Um, and being able to jump in, sorry, Luke, uh, being able to jump into these things without thinking through them too much, because I think us as online leaders, we want to like plan it out and put the project map together and it takes six months, eight months, 12 months to implement something. And by that time we missed the train. So we need to be quick to implement some of those things. Yeah, I think agility is important. Our colleague Katie Lender put in the chat systems thinking. And, and I think one of the systems is, have we approached our designs from the student's experience, right? So for me, it's journey mapping. You know, I need, I need to get people familiar with what that is, why you do it, and how you do it, and then consistently apply it. Um, so speaking of how, that's, that's our next question. So you under, you've identified capabilities, but how are you developing those within your team, right? So it's one thing just to identify like, oh, we have this need like strategic thinking, but how are you developing those? So Andrea, tell us how that's working at Jackson State. You know, prior to the um, shift to mostly online learning, some of our faculty, I'm sure, as well as others, were resistant to adapt to new pedagogies and tools and often defending that their teaching method methods um, by claiming that, you know, their usual approaches were just fine and it always worked. But the new online environment space has offered us the opportunity to really provide teaching and learning professional development in response to the needs that our faculty expressed over the last year. We were able to stop and listen to them and work one on one, you know, with our faculty and our academic units. Um, we, we view this as an opening to establishing a num number of teaching and learning initiatives using the needs to highlight by moving to online um, identified through both a survey. So we, we surveyed our faculty and a series and had a series of conversations, increased our lunch and learns um, to generate an environment that embraced the um, growth mindset for faculty as well as students. And what about our other panelists? Anything that you're doing a little differently? And thank you, Andrew, for focusing on faculty, you know, because I think we have to be sensitive to the new capabilities that they need to best serve our students. They're, they're on the front line and interacting most with our students. Melissa? Yeah, so, um, so like I said, earlier, uh, we launched our first fully online master's degree in fall of 2020. So it's pretty, pretty new to our college. Um, and one of the things that we're really working on is training our academic advising team in um, how to advise students in the online virtual setting. And everybody had to do that, you know, for the last year and a half with COVID. So it was kind of a jumping feet first into the fire. But that's something that we're really thinking about. Do we offer evening, you know, virtual walk-in hours? Like, how are we making sure that that success team is accessible to students? And I was briefly just going to mention faculty as well. Um, I think the most important thing that, you know, the how are we going to get this done is the collaboration with the faculty, the really talking to them, understanding where they are, um, and establishing those professional relationships, because that's really going to put us um, 
at the same level with them and help um, help us show our strengths and them show their strengths and we both come out ahead that way. Yeah, my last thought on this, you know, just in the entrepreneurial domain, right, of leadership is that um, I think it's important to constantly tell people why. Why are we trying this new process? Why are we introducing this new product? Why have we, um, why have we gone down this path of, you know, innovation? Um, I, I think it's important regardless of who the stakeholders are, uh, students, faculty, staff, you know, uh, people that hold us accountable in all different shapes, forms, and fashions. Um, so, you know, I think being willing and open to answer the question why and really understand why you're doing something and being able to articulate it is, is a capability we have to develop and then, and then encourage in others um, by leading by example. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I see some, I think, questions in chat. Um, let's see. Uh, love to hear more about differentiating between the various roles connected to the larger label of instructional design. Okay, we'll we'll circle back to that. So Megan and Kim, hold us accountable for that question. I think we're going to have an opportunity uh, coming up to do that, but I, I didn't want to lose it in the um, I didn't want to lose it in the chat. So we're going to go to our next topic again, trying to be mindful of time uh, and talk about the future is diverse. Um, and as the panel when we prepared, you know, for us, what we see is a future that's more diverse. A diversity of leaders are, will emerge and are emerging, as you see on the screen uh, in the online learning space, and lead efforts in new directions. Um, and so, you know, what, but what does that mean? And how can we uh, support a diverse future and prepare for it? And so that gets us to our, our first of two questions uh, uh, that we have is how can you, so talking to our panelists, hire such that your faculty and staff reflect your students? Um, and we're going to uh, our, our friend at uh, FIU first. Yeah, so I think at FIU we're a very we're a very unique institution. We're in a unique position in that we're in the heart of Miami, which is one of the biggest melting pots in the country. Um, so there is inherent diversity um, within our students and within our faculty. Um, but it's important, I think, for us to be intentional about who we're bringing in and the role that they're going to have within the department. So not just, you know, checking the boxes of, yes, we're diverse in all of these ways, but really seeing how people can bring things um, of value and, and, and skills of value and knowledge of value into our institution. Um, I would say that there's a lot of untapped markets that maybe perhaps we're not looking at, and that's with everything. That's with um, uh, students coming in, with faculty that we might hire, and with staff we might hire. So we have a lot of alumni um, from different countries, different cultures, different demographics, and we haven't necessarily done a great job about recruiting and marketing these folks to bring them back into the institution. So they may have graduated from here, um, but then we kind of lose them. So if me, I'm a lifelong FIU. I, I did my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD. I've worked here for 10 years. And so for me, it's important to bring these people back. Um, and, and that's going to help us with our diversity because our students are already diverse. Um, and then um, on the flip side of that, I think we have faculty that come from a lot of different um, a lot of different places, pockets of, of really diverse backgrounds, but we haven't made the connections with those particular countries to bring in students from there. So we have the faculty from there, but we're missing, you know, the students coming in and joining that as well. So I think we have to do a better job of really understanding the different domains of learning in the different cultures, meeting people where they are um, culturally, politically, personally, and and creating an environment that really fosters and, and makes people of all kinds um, feel safe um, so that they feel comfortable coming to work here, coming to study here. Um, so it's all about, you know, just putting people in the right places so that, um, so that everybody feels welcome. Andrea, what about you? What are your thoughts yeah. on this topic? So at an HBCU, this is very critical. You know, we make an effort to bring in alumni when possible um, who understand the university culture. And we have good relationships with faculty who help us connect to um, with potential staff. You know, our faculty is hired um, through our academic areas, but the university has a commitment to diversity that is evident in our hiring record. And Melissa? 
Yeah, so we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that's comprised of faculty, staff, and students, and they've put together um, a hiring guide for trying to achieve a more diverse candidate pool for faculty, and now we're working to uh, uh, adapt that guide for our staff. Um, we're also recipients of the NIH FIRST grant, which is a program to increase representation of faculty um, from underrepresented groups in biomedical science. And so that's a huge gap for us because that's really going to support us in going out and hiring more. And then the other thing we're doing is that we're trying to do cluster hires where we hire folks in the cohort model. Uh, because beyond hiring, once you have, you know, staff and faculty in your school, you want to make sure you're supporting them and making everybody feel welcome. Doesn't do you any good to hire a bunch of um, people if they're going to come and then not feel welcome and then leave. And I know we're going to talk about strategies. One of the ones that, uh, can you go back one, uh, please? One of the ones I, I really like is this idea of, of hiring in pairs. So if you're really trying to achieve this, you hire folks in pairs so they're not alone, right? Uh, especially if it's your first hire uh, for whatever metric you're trying to achieve. The other thing that I like, and, and uh, I, did, I haven't said this, right, but I serve five uh, independently accredited community colleges. They're all Hispanic serving institutions, and one is also an HBCU. Uh, and and the, I like that we've put metrics to it, right? So we, it's not an aspiration. We've moved beyond aspirational to how do we truly reflect our community? Because I live in a minority majority community, right? And, and it is even more important and more evident um, that, that we do this and do this well. Um, and so I, I think that is the, the, the how is moving from aspiration to action. Um, and, and, you know, one of the first steps we took, and I'll, I'll share this with you all here, is working with USC's Center for Race and Equity on really talking to our hiring managers, right? So our deans, our chairs, on being aware of, of just your process and then what happens inside of interviews and what to look for. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to share just some actionable things that I'm experiencing here that have just really opened my eyes because I hear a lot of aspiration, but I'm like, I'm very action oriented. So like, what do we do? All right, I'm convinced, but what do we do? Uh, and speaking of that, that's our, our, our kind of next set of questions. Um, is specifically to online learning leaders is what is the role of online learning leaders in preparing a diverse faculty and staff? You know, what role do we have to play inside of our organizations? And I, I, um, I really like this question. Andrea, we're going we're gonna to go to you first on what you think about our role, right, speaking to other online learning leaders in the audience. You know, we need to make sure that as an online learning leader, you know, it's very important that we make sure that our teams are knowledgeable, you know, of the kind of demographics that we serve. And so just making sure that they're aware and providing the necessary resources and training to make sure that, you know, everyone is successful. And our other panelists? Um, yeah, I'll jump in. I think that um, one thing that online learning leaders really need to do is just look in at themselves and look at your own unconscious biases and make sure they're really affecting how you interact with your colleagues. You know, I know everybody wants to think they're a good person. They are good people, um, but we all have them. And so you have to know them and name them before you can eradicate them from your behavior and your thinking patterns. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say too, um, really looking at our teams and realizing what everyone's you know skill set is what everyone's potential is and using that to the team's advantage and to the employees ad advantage as well so you know people know what they're good at and if you take time to truly understand the person and know where they are and what they can contribute um I think that we can situate our folks in the right places in order to have the most impact you know and of course recruiting and hiring strategically um to fill um, not only the diversity gaps, but the skills gaps that we have, right? So going back to what I said earlier, it's not really just to, you know, to check the box to make sure that we have, you know, the required diversity, but it's really to bring in a diverse group of people with diverse group of life experiences um, to really maximize the impact and the success and the, the knowledge that our team can have. And so we can make a bigger impact. I hadn't planned to say this, but I, I'm experiencing this all in the, uh, webinar to webcast with you, I think you, our role is you have to speak into it, right? Like you're all doing. You have to speak into, I have a role 
right? I, I'm going to own my role within the organization, which may mean that it doesn't advance online learning, but it advances the success of the organization as a whole. You know, and I'm hearing you all do that. I'm, I'm inspired, all right? Because you're doing that, right? You're, you're showing what our role should be. And so I'm, I'm very thankful to you for, for doing that. I'm going to ask our next question because I want to spend some time there, right? Is, is how do we create a culture that retains diverse faculty and staff? And, and there's a, a, a comment I made in the, the chat, right, in response to another one of our colleagues in the call. But how do we create a, a culture that retains uh, diverse faculty and staff? And uh, Lurgy, I think we're coming right back to you. Yeah, um, so I don't know about uh, the other folks institutions, but I know that F I know for a fact, I'm confident that FIU Online does a really good job of creating an environment where I think everybody feels um, welcome, comfortable and seen. Um, so uh, there was a, a question in the chat that was talking about the different levels of, um, of ID, and I think we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, I think one thing that we do exceptionally well is asking everybody for feedback. And that means um, our management and our leadership, but also our student assistants and our junior uh, IDs and, and things like that. We put everybody on committees. We want everybody to be involved and to have a say. Um, and that helps, I think, with um, promoting um, the diverse staff, right? Because we're not only looking at the leaders, we're looking at everybody and we're looking at everybody's ideas um, and really putting that into practice where it fits, right? So. We have the advantage, like I said, we have the advantage of having a diverse um, employee, uh, you know, staff just because of where we are, but really taking those people's voices and actually making them be heard and including them in conversations and decision making, I think, has been um, has been integral for our success. Andrea or Melissa? Add that, you know, when, I, when your faculty and staff see the diversity, they begin to appreciate it. And so we, we've created a welcoming environment and those environments, they actually show that we don't just have a pockets, different pockets of diversity, but the university, the university is diverse as well. And if I could just jump in really fast, um, one thing that we've done, which has been near and dear to my heart, is we've started to really include staff in um, the school leadership decision making. So we have a staff coordinating committee and they meet monthly and then they meet quarterly with the um, other, with the faculty from the faculty committee, with students and with the dean as a part of a school council. We're piloting that right now, but it's been a really great way to be much more inclusive of students and staff in those decision making um, situations for the school. This one's real near and dear to my heart. I've, I've practiced it for a long time, but I'm a lot more intentional where I am now is that, our, and I'll, I'll put it in this context, our chancellor has a, uh, a monthly show called A Seat at the Table. And I make sure the people who I call leaders and are on, on what I refer to as our leadership team within Alamo Colleges Online have a seat at the table, right? So I'm intentionally putting them into situations where they can be a part of decisions, inform decisions, not only my own, but those that affect the organization and then coaching them to that, right? And it comes with a level of vulnerability that I didn't know I would ever be comfortable with in my career because you just got to say, hey, here's what's going on. And I want you to fully be aware of what you're walking into and that way you can contribute the best. And then let's talk about that, right? And I think part of it is, is not holding information or skills or what you're observing. Um, and I spend a lot of time sharing information, but for the sake of how is that a benefit our strategy of what we're trying to do as well as help the organization as a whole. And I think giving people a seat more than just, I put them on a committee, right? But coaching them to success is important because then they gain a sense of agency. Like, you know, we could never imagine, right? Because people then begin so you start talking about speaking uh, things into the future, you start to say one day you will be leading this group or a group like it, and you will want to think about these things. Um, SER connecting with that, right? But I, I think that's an important how. It's telling someone you see them in a future role. Like, you, you know, you're not always going to be in that role where you are now. There's another role for you. Are you preparing for it? And some people haven't come to accept their talent. I'll just say that, right? Like, maybe it's a part of our job to say, you know, you're talented. 
you're actually really talented at this. This is your superpower. I caught myself saying that to people during the um, during the pandemic. I would say, hey, you know, you have the superpower. Did you know that? Can you use that a little bit more on our team? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I I just get excited about this opportunity to build up other people, right? Because at the one on one level is where we can make a really big impact. I don't know what y'all think about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's so critical. And I think that, you know, for myself, uh, that's how I've gotten to where I am is by mentors, you know, saying like, you can do this, you are a leader, um, and then started to view myself that way. Um, so I think it's really important for folks to do that. Yeah, and I think a big part of it, too, is the transparency, right? So if, if you know, higher leadership um, is transparent with, with, the rest of us and share that share that information and say hey there's this big thing coming from the top we don't have all the details yet but you need to be involved because you know we need to figure this out and you guys are the ones in the weeds and even us down to our teams you know you guys are the ones in the weeds you're working on this stuff tell us tell us what you think the solution is right because sometimes i think we remove ourselves in leadership and administration we're not in you know in the thick of it and so i think by by being transparent by sharing what's coming and by asking for the input like how is this going to affect your day to day sitting at the desk um that's going to help also um you know empower the team and also bringing them like like luke said this this could be your you could be sitting here tomorrow so you need to be ready to make these decisions and know what's going on right so we're going to pivot to our next topic. This is this is great. I hope our audience, I hope you all are having a great time. We can't see you. I, I look forward to those days where we can fully see everyone, right, and read your body language and know that we're, we're giving you what you need. That's important to us as panelists. So we added this topic in. We gave ourselves permission, WCET did too, to switch out our topic of global to talk about the future is hybrid work. Um, and, and so I, um, I, I want to thank our panel. It was not my idea. They were like, hey, we want to talk about this. Um, so, so we're going to tackle a couple of questions here, and I think they're very critical and timely uh, for our discussion. Uh, one, and, and I don't know which one of you said this, but I loved it because it's just so direct, right, is how do we maintain a sense of community when no one's on campus? Um, and, and so I'll, we'll start there. Um, we'll start with, you know, how do we maintain this sense of community when no one's on campus? Yeah, so for FIU, I mean, I have to give it to our, our operations team. They were incredible in handling remote work. Um, even prior to, um, to COVID, uh, the instructional design team had already implemented a, a partial telework program. Um, and then when we had to, the whole university had to go into emergency remote mode in March 2020, the university actually asked us for our, all of our policies, our procedures, and our documentation that was then implemented university-wide. Um, during the pandemic, we had all sorts of um, connecting experiences. So we had fully virtual team meetings. In fact, at one point, the School of Hospitality um, did a thing where they taught us how to make drinks, right? And after four months of isolation <laughs> um, during COVID, that was really well, uh, well received. Um, but yeah, I think um, the afternoon cafecito chats that we did online, um, or other virtual get togethers, I mean, it really helped to foster a sense of community. And I think within our own teams, you know, just calling people up on Slack, on Slack and saying, how are you doing? How's it going? How's your kiddo? You know, you have kids at home. Um, so just maintaining that, that connection that uh, goes back to relationships and people. Um, but I think our department really did a great job with that. Yes. And I'll add that although we oversee distance learning, working from home was new to our team. Um, but I must say the transition was good and what I expected. We were prepared just as if we were have, had always worked remotely. Um, we looked at it as the new norm being our regular norm. So in the beginning, we had daily morning chats to check in on needs and also memo check-ins and, and whatever projects we needed to work on. And so we also continued this practice like when we came back. So we're fully, you know, on campus now, but the practices that we implemented during that time, you know, we sustained those practices. 
And a, a really kind of hot topic of conversation about this here has been not just for um, faculty and staff, but for the students, how do they in a fully online program maintain a sense of community? And so I did my master's degree and my EDD both online. And in my EDD, we had this WhatsApp group for my cohort that was like literally a lifesaver for the program. And we talked about you know, successes in our lives, brainstorm problems we had to solve, um, maybe complained about a class or two. And um, it was just great. So when we were talking about, you know, doing our fully online master's degree, I said, we have to figure out a way to like get our students to do this, but it has to be organic. It can't, we can't set it up for them. And our uh, director of student services has been phenomenal. And so she's really encouraged the students and they have started using some of these back channel ways to communicate so they can have those hallway conversations, even though they're not in person. So I would offer this, we're in a, we have 5,000 employees, right? We're a very big, complicated matrix place. And one of the practices that I have to give our chief HR officer a lot of credit is we started rounding. So she took HR members and they were calling any, anywhere from 45 to 100 employees a day. And then the leadership team would get a kind of a, a digest of what was being shared. So we had a hand on the pulse real time, right, of what people were feeling and experiencing, their anxieties, their challenges, any, you know, what they were trying to manage. And we've continued that. And although not everyone sees that feedback, because it's not, that's not appropriate, right? It does impact decisions, but it also has a cascading effect. We call it rounding. So I don't know if y'all do leader rounding, but anybody on the call, if you do that, please share uh, your experiences in the chat. That's something I've learned here in the last three and a half years. There's intentional rounding. And especially when an issue pops up that you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know this was being experienced in my community. You go talk to the people about it, right? You don't just like, oh, this is interesting. Um, leader rounding has been effectively used before the pandemic, but we continued to use it in the pandemic. And so I wanted to offer that. And I think it has given a sense of community. My staff and I joke, so just within our team, right, in online learning, uh, I became a better slacker. Uh, so I, uh, I jokingly say that, right, we're, we use the tool Slack and we're not, we're not sponsored by them, by the way. Uh, if they want to sponsor us, we'll welcome it, but we're not sponsored by Slack. Uh, but it was nice. It was a way for me, too, to check in individually with people. Like, hey, how are you doing? Hadn't seen you on the screen in a while, right? What's going on? And I found out things about people that, you know, I wouldn't have even known face to face. So I think it was a chance for me to deepen some community and also use my superpower, which is caring. And so, you know, I, um, my family jokes with me about that, right? So it's a separate joke, but, you know, that is it. And so it was, it gave me a chance to lean in, but lead around me is something I would, I would encourage. So this next question, let's go to this next question. This is another great one. So again, I have to give all the credit to your panelists. They, um, they really uh, wanted to talk about this topic of, and I know Kim, you put in the, um, the, the chat and there's gonna be a closer conversation. Those are really cool if you haven't experienced them with WCET, uh, a closer conversation on this topic, but how do you deal with burnout, self-care and renewal? Uh, and um, I'm gonna share some a little bit, but I'm more interested in what the panelists have to say. So I think we're doing a round robin on this one. I don't know who wants to start. I'll start. You know, I changed up and I know it's about you're asking me, how do I deal with it? But I really I changed up how I facilitated our weekly meetings by opening up with motivational quotes and giving the team the opportunity to share any kind of self tip, self care tips, personal development. I asked them, what are they reading and what are some of the highlights and sharing time? So we, I give them a time to share. And so we always know no matter how many things we have that are pressing. I start every meeting like that. That actually helps me because it takes me out of that leadership zone just to see what, what, what are they reading? You know, what are things that they have going on? So that really has helped me doing after the pandemic and now. So that, that's helped a lot. Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the biggest thing I think is to actively practice being kind and just giving everybody a little bit of grace. Um, and I actually I talk about this a lot with the faculty, especially when we had to move to remote instruction and people were you know, really upset about being thrown into this environment they didn't know. I said, give your students a little bit of grace. 
and they'll give it right back to you. And I really find that that's true also with my colleagues is that as much as possible, if I can give people grace and understanding and I'm kind, it usually ends up bouncing back. I like that. Yeah, and I would say for me, this one was hard, um, right? Because deep down, I am a prescriptionist. I am a rule follower. Things are the way they need to be and we cannot deviate from the norm. And so I found that I had to mentally shift um, and I have done that and it's a good place for me to be and I've stayed there, right? So I'm happy about that. That was a win for me personally, right? Um, but my mantra really was, let's do what we can when we can. So I had a toddler at home. Um, work was not getting done during you know, the nine to five of work hours, but like everybody else, like our colleagues, like our managers, our leadership, we understood what the human element was of what was happening to everybody. Um, and I really learned to have a lot of empathy and understanding to really let people work, um, not only from a flexible space, but also flexible timing and flexible mentality and just whatever worked for them to be able to get the job done. As long as the work got done, it was fine. Um, I found that my team really at appreciated that flexibility. And then I um, afterwards found out that we had our most productive year that we've ever had um, in my team. So I think it was beneficial to kind of just let people do what they were able to do when they were able to do it. And we found that that it actually worked better. So I'm really proud of the, the work that they ended up doing because the team was very successful just by you know, by being there when they could and not not forcing people to be there at a specific time really gave them the the freedom to say, you know what, this needs to get done. I can do that after I put the kiddo to bed. Yeah, I, uh, for me, it was about giving people permission. I know it sounds odd, probably not stated correctly, to take off. Like, you, you need to stop. You need to take time. You took time off. Why are you on Slack? Turn the notifications off. I, I've never had to tell people that like I had in the past 18 months. Like, you need to take a break. You're showing up tired and I care about you. Your health matters. Like, there's all, I almost wrote a blog post about the things I said to people in the pandemic in, in, in bulk, right, that I had never expressed or expected to express as a leader, right? But I got, I and a lot of you know me, I depend heavily on reading body language and all that. And this is all you get, right, on Zoom. But I got really good at watching what did show up, right? And, and trying to read, all right, what's going on, right? And listening to tone and mood and all of those things became new tools. But it was really about trying to get people to just take off, like, you know, because people didn't want to fail. They didn't want to let the organization down. They didn't want to let students down. Man, you saw the humanity in folks. I'm sure y'all did, right? Wow, it came out. But what got took a backseat was, was self-care. And I think we're in this point now, right? That's what we're experiencing with people is with the great resignation. And, and I, I've experienced that, right? As people were taking stock of where they were in their relationship with work. Um, and if we want to retain people, I think we're going to have to continue to be attentive to these things. But I just wanted to add to what you were already saying. It was really great. Any other Look, and I would just say, Go ahead. I'm so sorry. And it helps when your team reciprocate what you're doing. When they stop and say, have you eaten lunch? Or, you know, why are you staying so late? We leave you here. It really helps, you know, that you see what you're doing for them when they reciprocate that. And I also think it helps, if I could just jump in with one more thing, it helps when you um, set the example by like showing taking time off. So we're up for reaccreditation with CEIF if anybody's in public health. And after we got the first draft of our self-study done, our associate dean for uh, academics, who's my boss, said, I'm taking a week off and y'all are not going to contact me. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. So then I did that a few weeks later. And, but he gave me the permission almost to do that for myself. One of our team members who was an uh, elite level Yelper, uh, I didn't know what that was, you know, because I wasn't a big Yelper until she, she, I was like, oh, this is cool. And she lost that status, right, during, uh, during COVID. One of the things she started doing without prompting was putting in Slack, I'm going to lunch. And that was such a game changer. So people started saying, hey, I got I to gotta do homework for a minute with my child. Or th that one action opened up this whole different use of our general Slack channel, right? Um, so I agree, Melissa, like 
and it doesn't always have to be the leader. It wasn't me. I probably wasn't modeling the behavior well. She did, right? And then elevating that and then participating in it, I think it was helpful. So we're to audience questions. We've got about 11 minutes left. We did it, y'all. We, we covered our content, so congratulations. Um, but we've got some questions, and um, we didn't forget about the good question earlier. So here's one from earlier is would uh, love to hear how people are differentiating between the various roles connected to the larger label of instructional design. Here this job family includes four different levels. So the ID label is a sort of catch all label for the institutional community. I have some feedback on that, but I wanna you know, invite you first panelists to respond. So I can share what we're doing um, at FIU. We recently just restructured our learning design team, um, which is a change in itself, right? It was instructional design and now it's learning design. Um, and we have gone from just having ID level one, two, three and senior uh, to having more specific roles targeted at specific work. So we have um, instructional design consultants that do the one-to-one -one support in designing new courses. Uh, so if anybody here is from Florida, we have the state Flor uh, the Florida State Initiative for the university system that is asking for all online courses to come up to um, quality standards, which is through the Quality Matters rubric. And so we've had to realign our processes, right? Because we support uh, all of the online and hybrid courses. So at this point, I think we're up to like 1800 or something like that. So it's not attainable and it's not scalable if we don't do something about it. So we've changed our consultant model. Those folks are working with courses that are new. And then we have our support teams that are larger, more support staff. So we have supervisors and then we have assistants and um, associates and specialists uh, that help these supervisors, but they maintain a load of like 200, 200 and something courses. They're able to do that because it's a faculty driven model and not us um, proactively working on every single one of those courses like we used to because we just don't have the capacity to do that anymore. So our our structure here, I want to say, is associate specialist, uh, consultant, and supervisor. So we're at four as well, uh, but the roles are delineated by the work that they're actually doing. Our instructional designers are in the field, so they're, they're detached to a college, uh, and they spend most of their time there we worked for a year and a half on a staffing model. Uh, so one that stair steps because we wanted to retain instructional designers. I don't know if y'all watched the WCET job post or really any of the job post sites. Instructional designers to me by far uh, the most uh, hot commodity in terms of people trying to find that talent uh, within our industry. Uh, and you know, I don't know that we'll get full buy-in on our staffing model. I think uh, what you said, Lurgio, is you gotta look at different ways to do your work. And I think, you know, once we built it and then we're thinking differently about our work, but my model has always been a triage model. I've never done the full, we're going to build this from start to finish. Um, so we are definitely in the, and have continued to be and it served us well in this kind of triage model of instructional design. Melissa, Andrew, any other thoughts on that? I want to make sure that we have some other questions coming in. Megan, did we miss any or Kim? I just scrolled back through, Luke, and I didn't see anything, but people still have a chance if they want to put them in or or put a note in there about what you're expecting to uh, sort of need to tackle over the next year or so that's different from what we've discussed. Well, and I want to say this as we get towards the end of our, our session and as we've uh, enjoyed putting this together, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, Y'all did a, a amazing job today responding to the questions and um and glad that all of those of you who showed up stayed with us um the entire time and we hope you got what you needed but feel free we still got a few minutes for a question and answer um and we certainly would welcome your uh your your comments this is our contact information um so please you know you're invited to get in touch with us the best way to reach me i'm going to be honest is on linkedin so if you email me, so Megan, to your point, I, I might not get to it. Uh, and oh, unfortunately, this is being recorded, but I'm just going to be honest with you, my colleagues. So LinkedIn is, LinkedIn is the best way to get to me, uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of our other panelists. Um, any final thoughts, Melissa, Largia, Andrea, that you want to make before we sign off? And, and Megan, I know you got some closing uh, comments.
Luke, there was just a, a good comment in there from Nancy. I don't know if you want to take a few minutes to have the panelists discuss uh, dealing with accountability with remote working. Even when providing great flexibility, there may be issues. I could say for our team, we're mostly distributed right now, and they just have a lot of work, and they they are proud of doing good work. And I, the accountability I have with them is making sure that they find space in their day for themselves. So I think it depends on you know what what the expectations are and the support there. So what do, yeah. what do the others have you have to say? I'll jump in because one of the people on my team um, asked to be fully remote after the pandemic, and I really fought to, to get that for her. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, just looking at performance performance goals, right, and uh, meeting key metrics, right. And this girl is a woman; she's not a girl. Uh, she's a top performer. Like she is always on Teams. She's always on her email. She gets everything done and she does it really, really well. So if I had a staff member on my team who wasn't maybe meeting their goals, then I would talk to them about it. But I think that, you know, in my experience, you can waste time in your office just as much as you can waste it at home. So it's more about looking at those performance metrics and making sure that they're being met. And I agree, Megan, setting expectations. And also setting realistic goals, because, you know, sometimes when, when we hear remote working, it's like you have so many more hours in the day, but setting realistic timelines and realistic goals to make sure that they can accomplish the projects and the things that, you know, they, they need to be held accountable for. Yeah, and in my, in my team, we're very performance driven, product driven, right? So we know whether they're doing their job or not because otherwise the work wouldn't be there the courses wouldn't be online um, and so it's very easy to see you know is the is the work getting done and i think that that was part of me shifting my mentality as well is i don't necessarily need to be getting on people's back if they're not sitting in their desk by 8 10 8 15 but are they doing what they're supposed to, uh, what they're supposed to do? Are the courses getting done? Is any faculty calling me and saying, listen, I haven't been able to get a hold of this person in a week? You know, those are the red flags that like Melissa says, if we see issues with performance, then we address them. But I think giving people the flexibility to do what they need to do in their in the time that they have is is essential and i think yes um somebody just put um in the chat it, it is about trust mm -hmm. uh developing that trust in your team to know uh that they're capable of doing the work and that they'll get it done in the time that they have available to them but nancy i would say that you can lose visibility on the contributions of team members and this recently happened to me and what i've done is empowered them to say please manage up because if i'm asking you what you're working on i don't have visibility on it doesn't mean you're not working. I just need it to be more visible. Uh, and a lot of it is really about making sure that we're working on the right priority because a lot of our projects aren't start, finish, right? They're start, stop, fits and starts. And then there's other things that are layered in between that. So it's easy to lose visibility on the number of things that you're working on. So just, I would say, yeah, I, I understand the accountability piece. I've dealt with it, but I speak into it as well. I'm like, I don't have visibility on what you're working on. I need help there, right? And I use that phrase uh, a lot. I need help. Um, I need your help uh, to understand. And um, so I just want you to know, I really understand your question and experience it, not in a punitive way, because I think we react to accountability as, as a negative thing sometimes in our culture. Uh, but, but I see it as how am I helping this person be successful when I don't see them face-to-face -face anymore, right? And I can't can't kind of get a, a sense of what they're working on because they've stopped in the office and said, hey, Luke, I'm working on that thing today. Because um, that, that was lost, right? At least for my team. Um, okay, Megan, you got two minutes. I think we have to give the, give the floor to you. All right, great. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you all. And as was mentioned, we're having a closer conversation, which is just a, a, a loosely organized conversation around key topics. And tomorrow's is creating community when there is no community. So how do we deal with the challenge of, of fully remote courses and keeping our students engaged? So WCT members, please join us for that. If you're new to WCT, please get on our website and see all the cool things that we have to offer. We also have a brand new website. So if you're not new to WCT, visit our website and see some of the new features that we have there. Again, the webcast was recorded. We'll share the link out. But visit this webpage and you can access previous 
recordings to conversations like this. Just need to take a minute to acknowledge our sponsors and our WCET supporting members because they underwrite much of our work here at WCET and we're very grateful for them. A final plug for our annual meeting, which is just coming up on November 2nd. And I know you're thinking November so far away, but it's not, it's coming. So make sure to get registered. We have great group discounts and an excellent program. WCT members, we are announcing as of yesterday, our December policy series. So make sure to get registered for that. It's open to WCT and WCT SAN members. And that is it. So thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you for the work that you put into this. Thank you for your wisdom and your inspiration. And thank you, Luke, for leading this conversation. Take care, everybody. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>